Hello, everyone. My name is Holland Perryman, and I am an intern at the Pat Conroy Literary Center. Welcome back to the sixth annual Pat Conroy Literary Center Festival, which is made possible this year by the generous support of the Robert S. Handler Trust and the South Carolina Humanities Growth Grant. We're also grateful today for the host venue, the Technical College of the Low Country, for making this space available to us. In Late City, the newly published novel from the Pulitzer Prize winning writer, Robert Olin Butler, a 115 year old man lies on his deathbed as the 2016 election results arrive. And he re revisits his life in a moving story of love, fatherhood and the American century. In the Star Review, the American Libraries Association Booklist magazine said this of Late City. With two dozen remarkably imaginative and empathetic fiction titles to his credit, Butler brings preternatural attunement to the spiraling of the mind and ardently honed artistry to this exceptionally nuanced, tender, funny, tragic, and utterly transfixing portrait of a man reflecting on more than a century's worth of horror and wonder. We are honored to be able to host Mr. Butler today. He is also the author of 18 previous novels, including Hell, A Small Hotel, and Perfume River. He is also the author of six short story collections and a book on the creative writing process from Where You Dream. Mr. Butler has twice won a National Magazine Award in Fiction, and he received the 2013 F. Scott Fitzgerald Award for Outstanding Achievement in American Literature. He teaches creative writing at Florida State University. Mr. Butler will be interviewed by a dear friend to our Conroy Center, Bren McLean. Her critically acclaimed debut novel, One Good Mama Bone, published by Pat Conroy's Story River Books, won the 2017 Willie Morris Award for Southern Fiction and the 2018 Patricia Wynn Award for Southern Literature. Most recently, the French translation retitled Mama Red was selected for the 2021 Prix Maya, an award given for France's best animal novel. Ms. McLean is also a contributing writer to our Prince of Scribes Writers Remember Pat Conroy. Please welcome Robert Olin Butler and Bryn McLean. Appreciate that, Holland. Hey, Bob. Hey, Bran. How are you? Terrific. How are you? Good, good. Yeah, we've got a wonderful audience in front of me. We've got a wonderful audience zooming in. And welcome all to this, I think, going to be an incredible conversation with this man of letters, I think one of the most significant writers in American literature. And so we are in for a real treat. So thank you, Bob, for agreeing to do this with us. I'm, I'm delighted. Just sorry I can't be there in person. Well, we, un we understand. So, so, so folks, I've been incredibly blessed in my life. I have had the pleasure of having two, not just one, but two major champions in my life. Two major literary champions, one of which you all know already. It's Pat Conroy. My book, One Good Mama Bone, was published by Pat Conroy's Story River Books. So you all know how he changed my life, Pat Conroy. Oh, oh thank you. Thank you, Estelle. I appreciate you doing that. Um, and so today, I've got this amazing, gosh, Bob, pleasure to talk with my other champion. Actually, my first champion is this man that we are going to be in conversation with today, Robert Olin Butler, a man I call Bob. I want to take you back to how we know each other. I'll tell you right now that Bob and I go back 33 years. 33 years. I'm going to take you back, folks, to May. And yes, I do remember the day, May 13th, Bob of 1988. Whoa, that's a long time ago. Folks, I am a, a baby writer at that time. I was living in Atlanta, Georgia. I had just begun to write. I was writing short stories. The first short story I ever wrote was uh, one called uh, Desperation Dance. So I found out there was a writer's conference down I-20 from Atlanta in this town called Augusta, Georgia. It was the Sand Hills Writers Conference, my very first one I went to. So, man, I was so excited. Gosh, y'all, I registered. I got a hotel and my heart is like this. Boom, boom, boom. It's a Friday. I drive down that morning. And then in the afternoon, y'all, it was one of those things where you get teamed up with a writer to get critiqued, 
right? All writers know what I'm talking about. It was my very first one. And my gosh, was my heart beating fast. Well, I get teamed up with this woman. I'll just say her first name was Nancy. And I went into this room and gosh, you know, desperation danced this short story. And y'all, I sat down and I sat to the left of her and we were sitting at this table. And folks, I looked down and I saw on my story, my printed pages, enough red. <laughs> all over it every line circles in the margins red 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 i mean are you kidding me and i looked i remember looking down and tried not to cry i i just tried to buck up and said bran you know just take a deep breath and man y'all she just went through page after page after page of what was wrong didn't do this, didn't do this, didn't understand this, bad, 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 Bran. And I remembered sitting there thinking, gosh, boy, did you make a mistake? Wow, you have no business being here. When this is over, Bran, just hang on. It's about 15 minutes, just hang on. Then I want you to go get in your car and I want you to head straight back up 20, I-20 to Atlanta. So I just said, that's all you gotta do, Bran, just hang in there. So I hung in there. I got my pages at the end. I've probably said thank you because I've got some manners. And kind of ambled, you know, to the door and through it. And then, y'all, I just kind of turned down a hallway and just kind of collapsed, kind of collapsed against the, the wall. And do you know how you can feel sometimes that somebody's around? You know, I was kind of collapsed like this, but I felt this presence coming this way. And um, it was a gentleman. And he said, is everything okay? He said, very kind, very, very kind, an humble body. I said, uh, listen, hey, I don't know. I must have been out of my mind. I really must have been out of my mind. I, uh, I'm getting ready to go home. And he said, why? And I just kind of held out this bleeding, pages his way and he said oh and i said listen i, I must have been crazy i'm gonna go home this is my first conference i never should have been here and he said this to me y'all he goes hmm do you do you have another copy and i said oh well you know he said because if you do i'd love to see it i'd love to see that other copy and I went, oh, you know what? I just need to go, blah, blah, blah. And he kept insisting, kept insisting. So finally I leaned down and out of my little satchel, I got, you know, a clean, no red on it, no blood all over those pages and handed it to this kind, kind man. And he said, you know what? Why don't you stay? And let's have breakfast in the morning. Let me read it. Another set of eyes and let's have breakfast in the morning. And I thought, and I thought, and I went, well, okay. So we did, we had breakfast the next morning. And this was Robert Olin Butler, y'all. This was four years before he won the Pulitzer for a good scent from a strange mountain. Four years before, and this man's kindness. I mean, I'll never know, Bob, I'll never know if, you know, um, but it, it, it feels like to me, Bob, it feels like to me that you turned my life around and it is the reason I'm standing here today. And so I cannot thank you enough. And I tell you, y'all, if you've not read his work, you've got to. Robert Olin Butler embodies Pat Conroy's same generous, magnanimous, generous, magnanimous, just keep going, Bran, spirit. Do you see that? Do you see that? And so it is quite an honor, Bob, that you are joining us here today, sweetie. Quite an honor because you uh, and Pat have so much in common. You've, you uh, both changed my life. And so I wanna, th I wanna thank you. So Bob, this is the book. I even brought it as a prop. This is the book you autographed to me that day. <laughs> May 14th. That, that shows you how long that was ago. Yeah. Oh gosh, yeah. By the way, 
but by the way, that yeah. what I did was just minimal compared to the wonderful talent that resided in you and the extraordinary book that you have written. Well, Bob, thank you. Truly. Well, th thank you. So the other thing I want to say before we get to your glorious book, thank you, Bob, is that Bob told me way back then in May of 1988, he said to me that, Bran, when you write a book, I'm going to put some words on it. I'm going to put some words on the jacket. I'm going to give you a blurb. Folks, that was, let's do the math now. That's May of 1988. Do you all know when Mama Bone was published? February of 2017. Come on, math person. Yeah, wow, indeed. So 17 plus 12. Okay, 29 years. Bob Butler stayed true to his word, 29 years. And y'all, when I would see him out and about over the years, I took tons of classes with him. Uh, Bob always said this to me. He, he, would, he would kind of pick me out and he'd go like this, like he was riding in the air. And he would like nod, like, yo, I'm ready. I'm ready, Bran. And so just to bring this home before we start into your glorious late city, Bob, here's his, here's his blurb on the back of my book. Right there. He stayed true to his word. And God bless you, Bob Butler. So uh, I'm okay emotional. Uh, so um, you know what? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for not only your brilliance in writing, but, but your masterful human being. Yes. All right? Julie. Well, yeah. It was my honor to do that for you, Brown. It was, you, you did it, actually did it for yourself. It's just, it, uh, I'm delighted. So. No, we all need, how many writers do we have in the audience today? Yeah, a good many. Don't we need encouragement? Yes. Don't we look for champions? And I'm here to tell you, you don't need a slew of them. You don't need a slew of champions. You need one. You need a real good one who stays in there with you. And so my wish for all of you who are writers, both joining us in Zoom and in this glorious audience here today, my wish for you is a champion who would urge you on and stay with you through the years that it could possibly take you. So let's talk about your book, Bob. Wow. Uh, that, but that's a wonderful lesson that you just articulated there for for the folks there and the folks watching. So yeah, no, no, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, And I'm sure Bob, it's, uh, it's not just to me that you've been this champion. I mean, I think a champion has a champion's heart. Don't y'all think so? I think a champion has a champion's heart regardless. And so I'm sure you've done it for many, many others, Bob. So on behalf of writers everywhere, thank you. So now let's talk about your book. <laughs> oh my gosh, Lake City. <laughs> read most of Bob's books. And by the way, Holland said it. I mean, do y'all get this now? He's written 25 books. Let's see, Bob, you've written 18 novels, six short stories, and then that wonderful nonfiction book from Where You Dream, 25. And, and the week upcoming is a pretty important week coming up this yeah, week. Yeah, we've got, we've got a milestone coming up because uh, on November 11th, I think that's next Wednesday, Yep, yep. Um, the, uh, uh, it will be the 40th anniversary of the publication day of my first novel, The Alleys of Eden. So let's give 40. Come on, folks. 25 books in 40 years. He's got something going on, doesn't he? Whoa. And listen, it, uh, it, it, it runs the gamut. His, his talent is, is immense. Uh, his imagination is, is off the chart. I was just talking with somebody last night about um, Severed, uh, Bob, the, the head. Severance, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. That, that, and and that, that's a book of, 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 um, of, of stories written in the, in the voices, the internal voices of, of famous people who have just just after the blade has fallen and their head has been cut off. Um, because there is, there are some, there is some thought that there's some consciousness left after, after a decapitation. And so I, I was intrigued by the, by those 90 seconds or so that, um, you know. Yeah, and my favorite is Richard Nixon's thoughts. <laughs> 
before it finally goes. That is fascinating. Anyway, back to this. We won't talk about this novel, though. Yes. So I have to tell you all, Bob and I had a conversation last weekend, and we talked for an hour about what we were going to talk about. And so, <laughs> so we have a, a lot to say. Listen, Bob, I, 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 this book hit me personally on, on two different fronts. As, as Holland said, y'all, this is a book um, narrated by uh, Sam Cunningham, a 115-year-old World War I vet, the last living, uh, who is who is dying and who is who has deep regrets, deep, deep regrets in his life uh, on his significant relationships is, you know, his father, his mother, his son, his wife, I mean, his best buddy, all kinds of significant relationships. And this book is such a masterpiece because what it does, Bob, in my opinion, it just kind of peels back those relationships as this man is, is confessing really his life story to God, his, his, hi, Kathy, his, his life story to God. And as you peel back these significant relationships, and I'm in a part of my life that I'm doing the same, and I had no idea the uncanny parallel in that in my life, Bob. So this book, this book just really, really touched me. And I'll have to tell you, I, I, I wept at the end. It's a, uh, I, I just, I just can't believe it. Can I, can I tell you what my favorite part is? Sure, my sure. Book and the part that I just kept going back to. So, folks, like I said, this man, Sam Cunningham, is really ticking through his life, significant relationships to God, and uh, kind of making peace. Is that a good way of saying it? Making peace with it. And this comes from page 12, Bob, when, um, when Sam is a little boy with his papa, and they've, you know, the whole thing with, you know, and he's talking to his papa, and it's about the circle. And he's out, and um, and, and and he says, uh, my papa and I are in the center of a circle because he's drawn this, his father's drawn this circle around him. And, and it's these words here, his papa says, we got no choice in this life. We are here to figure out one thing. Who are we? Where do we belong? There has to be a circle around us because we ain't everywhere and we ain't everybody. We all understand that deep down, sometimes who's in that circle with you is clearly for the best. Sometimes it's regrettable, but you have to figure out where it must be drawn. And, and Bob, that's something, that whole idea of the circle and where you belong and who's in and who's out, you return to over the course of the novel. I, I love that facet of it. And, and, uh, and it's, I think it's significant that you focused on that aspect, Brand, because it goes to the heart of what I teach and what I understand about literary fiction. And that's, that's the thing that I teach and that's what you learned from me and that's what you're writing. But, you know, um, um, we all go back to Aristotle. Everybody who writes narratives goes back to Aristotle, who 2,300 years ago said that, that all narratives are about character, the central a character, a person who has goals and objectives. And those goals and objectives um, are thwarted and challenged in the course of the narrative. And that's as simple as that. And that is, that's still true of all narratives, all novels, all stories. Now, if you're writing works that have the primary intention of entertaining, then excellent fiction can be written that are fully absorbed with such character goals as winning a romantic partner or solving a crime or getting ahead in a career or escaping a monster or whatever, countless goals of that sort. But for literary fiction, I, by the way, have changed one of the words that it frequently uh, translated, usually translated by, from Aristotle, instead of goals and objectives, I prefer the word yearning. Mm -hmm. Because that suggests the, deep, the deepest level of human goal making. So what's there? What, what does the central character yearn for in, in literary fiction? And I, I, over the years, I've come to a, a form a kind of what 
borrow a term from Albert Einstein, a kind of unified field theory of yearning in literary fiction. I think if you dig deep enough in every work of literature that the character, the central character yearns for a self, mm. yearns for an identity, yearns for a place in the universe, you know? And, and why is this so in literary fiction? Because it is so in life. Mm -hmm. and, and literary fiction is about the human condition. You know, and just think about it. The things that are the, the flashpoints between people in this life, race and gender and politics and nationality and religion, for examples, mm -hmm. what are they? What are they? They are simply prefabricated answers to that great question, who the hell am I? And, and ultimately, in the complexity of human life, though some of those, some of the elements of some of those, those, those prefabricated answers, some elements of those may be part of the answer. But the problem goes back to, and it's interesting, ironically, one of the kind of the worst human beings in Lake City, Sam's father, yeah. actually articulates my fundamental my fundamental philosophy of literary fiction, which, which I was quite aware of that. I've, 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 I'm not sure anybody picked up on the, you know, the kind of inside joke about that, but you, you know, now you've heard it now. But, but in, in fact, that's the problem. He represents the problem because the, pu the pure embrace of mm. a fabricated answer creates, in fact, there are those who are your own and those who are other. Yep. And if they are other and their selves are, are legitimate, having embraced some different variation of this pre of, of what I have embraced, then they must be wrong and they must be even and often even worse than wrong. And so yeah, that's it seems to me at the at the heart of 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 uh, of what it is that we do as writers of, uh, of literary uh, fiction. And what you do so well, because this is, this is the question before your Sam. And to watch him, Bob, go through, kind of go through the significant people in his life and really deal with them. And then God keeps wanting him to kind of move on now, right? I mean, God keeps saying, are you done that now? So <laughs> Like, Let, let's let's pause there because we've we've made this observation, but the yeah. but the but the prefabricated image one has when we just say that God is asking this and He's doing this for God, that yeah. prefabricated answer, as with my the philosophy I've just said, that that is not a prefabricated God. This is this 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 God is a very different kind of dude. Yeah, or in, in many sort of at least superficial ways. Yeah, yeah. I laughed in it, Bob. I mean, he's got a sense of humor. And I said, go, God. I mean, say it, you know. And also, you know, we've got, uh, yeah. So, yeah, it wasn't the, the God that I grew up with at uh, New Prospect Baptist. I'll just put it that way. And, and there are some surprises that come in this book. That, you know, the book moves to some very important revelations oh in, all, in, in all sorts. The, the, the first of the 75,000 words here, the first 68,000 are, are, are take place in a nanosecond, you know, the moment of dying and this conversation and the review of the life. But the back end of the book, there are some major in the moment, in the actual living moment revelations in this book. And, uh, yeah. and, major, and not just one either, Bob. Uh, so, you know, I went back this morning and read the last maybe 30 pages again, again. And I'm just amazed at where you're, and I got it wrong. In the beginning, y'all, I was thinking, oh, okay, I know what's gonna happen. You know, I know what's gonna do, but I missed it, I missed it. And so, you know, even God himself talks to Sam about surprises. And so you, he's, he's in store for some and they're um, heartfelt. It, looking back on it, it's absolutely perfect and brilliant what what happens to him. And so um, I was so in the moment, though. You know, that's what you teach, Bob. 
writing sensory in the moment. And as a matter of fact, uh, y'all, that's, you know, that breakfast I was telling you about in Augusta many years ago. Bob sat down at that breakfast, and Bob, you started talking with me about using the senses oh, yeah. to tell the story moment by moment, sensory detail, not summary, not description, not analysis, right? See, I'm a good student of yours. I remember what you what you taught me. You sure you, are. Immediately, that's exactly what we how we are in with Sam. And you know, that, that problem is that I think um, so many aspiring writers, as you were, you guys got, you all got um, misled by the methods that of all the pedagogy of, of literature classes and even writing classes, the latter where it's all craft and technique and the former where it's theme and analysis and, um, and, and you know, and that's, you know, and that is that is it gives the impression that the the literary writer, especially the academic analyzing and thematic theme seeking, and all of that, and all of that, and and historical resonance of you know from past literature, all of that suggests then that that you know that that the 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 literary writer is a kind of idiot savant. That the object that they create, it, it's not really meant to can, to exist in in its final legitimate form as an object of the body of the senses. That mm -hmm. that that object has been created, but does not yet have meaning. You know, it's asked in classrooms all over the country. You know, Monday morning it will be asked a hundred thousand times. You know, what does this passage mean? What does this book mean? You know, as if it doesn't reside there. It has to be translated into these other terms for it to mean anything. And that's utter nonsense. That ultimately, you know, those things can and should be done perhaps, but only if, if the caution is given by the person whose pedagogy that is saying, look, what we're going to do is a, is an unnatural and an artificial uh, at task here, but we're going to do that in order to open up the parts of you that will respond fully to the next work of art you read. Because in fact, you're not meant when you read a work of art to understand it in an analytical abstract way. Right. When you read a work of literature, you are meant to thrum to it, mm. like, a, like a string vibrating on a stringed instrument. It is it is an innate sense based feeling of 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 harmony of of the larger organic vision of things, of some essence of of the human condition that. Um, that can't be gotten at in any other way. You know, it's interesting. An earlier uh, conference I appeared at in Decatur, Georgia, the, the, the Decatur Book Festival, wonderful festival. I appeared, that was one that was one of the few I was able to appear at in person. And the venue was the sanctuary of the First Baptist Church of Decatur, Georgia. All right. And big church, big congregation, you know, church, and they had enough distancing and so forth. And, you know, I, 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 at the big, very beginning, I made the point, you know what, that here we are to learn about literary, what, li, you know, literary fiction. That's what I'm here to try to talk about and identify. And I think it's appropriate that I'm here because the guy who is at the, the cornerstone of this building, the four books most closely written about him, all of them make the same point. That he, when he talked about the human condition, what the most important truths are, he did it only in one way. He told stories. You know, the, 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 the human condition, you understand it through, through vineyard workers and seed sowers, through mm. 
banquets and, and weddings, through mustard seeds and fishnets. You know, the portal, the entry into the into the greatest truths of the Ameri of, of the of the human condition, are through the, the, that entryway is through a mustard seed. You know, and so it's and and that's you know that's what that's what we that's what literary work does. I love your passion. You know, I've heard you speak. Look here, I brought this. This box, this folder. Look here, Bob. This is these are all the classes in my notes. Can you see it? That I <laughs> you can. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I know, uh, and I've heard you speak a lot, and I tell you, your passion is uh, palpable. I, I could just feel it in this room here. How much this matters to you, and 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 Bob, you you just so translate it in 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 the work that you've you've done. Um, you know, I was just telling some writer friends of mine last night, uh, you know, you actually believe in a kind of dreaming through a story, don't you? Yeah. Kind of dreamscape, I think, is what you talk dream, about. I call it, yeah, dream space. Yeah, that, that, um, that uh, um, the process, the process I go through, and I think, um, every writer goes through on, on, on some way, whether, they kind of um, make notes out of it, or whether they do it in in a kind of innate way, and then and then work through the the, the implications of that, just line to line, when they write draft after draft of a book. That this that process is a kind of what in other realms is called dream uh, brainstorming. I yeah. call it it's dream storming you have to you go to the place that you know and, and the book i wrote the, the about that I, that I was that i was a collection of my lectures about from about the creative process it's called from where you dream right. because because the fundamental point there is that that works of art do not come from ideas they do not come from concepts you know they uh they come, they come from the place where you dream. They would not from your literal dreams, but from your artist, your unconscious. Um, great British novelist Graham Greene put it in different terms, but it's the same point. In fact, <laughs> and and at age, at age seventy six, I fall back for uh, uh, for comfort by thinking that Graham Greene pointed out once that all good novelists have bad memories. So I. Um, and the fact that I've got a COVID, you know, besieged and, and septuagenarian besieged memory um, is just enhances the thing I've had all my life. Bad memory. But he, but he said, he says, good novelists have bad memories. He says, what you remember comes out as journalism. What you forget goes into the compost of the imagination. And... And, um, and, and, you know, you, 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 you know about compost down there or up there. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and, and that's, and that's, um, I think a, a, a kind of insightful way of looking at the place in you where you must go. And, right. uh, and that, yeah, and that, and that's another way of talking about your, your artistic unconscious or the space from, from, from which you dream. Because, you know, I've known you uh, long enough to know, I mean, you know, uh, your Louisiana connection with Lake Charles is kind of ish in this. Uh, uh, your Chicago, you, you grew up in Chicago, didn't you? Or you've got oh, I, grew up in, I grew up in the St. Louis area. I went to school. Right, I went right. to school in Chicago. And then I went back to Chicago after I got, out, got back from Vietnam uh, to begin a career in uh, business journalism. Um, right. And, and Bob, I think what you said is so important because I think as writers, fiction writers, you know, we, we feel compelled. We have to remember everything. Remember all the details of like like you were in Vietnam and you've done a lot of Vietnam novels. I mean, think about all of the details you put in all of those novels. And so the, the you know, somebody might want to 
you know, want to remember all those details, what the jungle looked like, what the smell in the air was, what the Vietnamese looked like, blah, 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 blah. But actually you're saying you need to forget to put that into the compost of your imagination. Yeah, that, that's, tr that's hey. true. And that, that's true. That's largely true that those things are in there. Now, in the, in the heat, in the heat of, of creation then, um, a lot of that sensory detail that you have from your experience, it will then, is you do remember it. That is you put the correct things on the page that are sense, that by the senses are, are, are accurate. Um, but um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a matter of, um, of, uh, of drawing it from which, which, which part. It's not a matter of having, having the, you know, the, the reminiscent details separate from the, the, the larger organic wholeness of the story you're creating. So that which of those details come back, so comes back at which moment is, is because it has a direct resonance into the thing the other, the rest of the work that you're creating. Now, at some points, you know, you do, you know, that you, you, you may forget the name of that tree or whatever, you know, or the, um, and um, um, so I did keep uh, in Vietnam. I kept extensive notes, writers' notebooks, you know. Yeah. Uh, so I've I did keep a lot of notes about those details that that could well slip away. Um, and, yeah. and now, um, honestly, for instance, late city, I'm not sure I could ever have written that book to the degree of sensual specificity, especially looking at all the sense details that might be authoritatively in that historic moment, because, you know, it covers the whole virtually the whole 20th century and, and beyond so that you can't you know to 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 have the range of details from that whole era whatever era is in this particular scene and to find just the right detail for that larger organic wholeness that I'm creating I could not have written this book without the internet the internet has made that possible. There's all the original source material. I can go back into the New York Times or the, the New Yorker or Vanity Fair or, 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 or the books of the time where you can read and find people uh, talking about, and, 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 the, and, and by the way, the, the Sears catalogs from those era. And by the way, you can see all the books behind me. I do, down, yeah. at the, down at the bottom here and over there on the other corner, there are, there are, there are years old Sears catalogs that I was collecting before the internet. I don't look at them anymore much, although I even still do, but they're on the, also on the internet now. But it's that kind of, it's that kind of detail work that you I alluded, the quality of which you alluded to earlier, um, that, um, uh, that, that makes all that possible. So that oh. you don't have to rely on your literal memory. You, uh, in a sense, get into character. You inhabit the character when you go researching so that he flashes on the tie that he has around his neck, you know? Oh. Or we see the, uh, the, the um, what, the throttle and the spark uh, right. devices on the steering wheel of the car that he's driving, you know? So yeah. that's, that's the kind of stuff that you, any writer will need some help with, but you, know, you, you research it in character. Right, so um, do you know a relationship that I loved Sam exploring? Mm -hmm. The one with his son. Yes, yes. One son, Bob. I'm thinking about the sledding scene. You know, he gets his son, Ryan, uh, a sled for Christmas and he is so eager. Sam is so excited to share that experience with his boy, you know, because there's snow in Chicago. There was not snow in Louisiana where Sam grew up, but he's so, and, and I love that you, you talk about, you, you wanted to see Ryan bubble. He, he was thinking that 
you know, this sled experience would help Ryan, his son, bubble up, you know? That was so well done and so tender. And I could just feel, I could just feel the father's, Sam's, um, wanting to connect with his boy through this sledding experience. Yeah. Loved, and, his, and, his, and his awful father had already implanted in him something that he needed he needed to reconcile in his life eventually. And that is what a man is, where that circle was drawn around them and, and, and what maleness is. And yeah. so that Sam's in that scene, Sam goes into the sledding with his with his son with an expectation of what his male son should be. And in fact, instead of loving the sleds, he finds, you know, his son making snow angels. Snow angels. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and it, 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 it baffles and unsettles Sam in a serious way. And, and, you know, and all of this relationship stuff, the ways in which he was sh shaped to try to understand them that even worked against you know his other instincts in him and other potentials in him he does not become fully human until he's 115 years old right that's right and that that moment just beautifully handled and how about the detail bob uh, of the fact that there is sam the daddy the man the man um who is trying to sled on a boy's on the on a yeah. right I love that yeah. detail i thought that was a brilliant move from you the fact i mean he notes that he notes that his man body is on this boy sled you know yeah. Yeah. i thought that carried and said so much yeah 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 yeah, yeah. And so he's so eager for his son to do this and he's like going down and all this stuff and he looks up and and he first of all he doesn't see his son and then he you know climbs the hill and there is his boy you know, um, so, you know, what really kind of happened, if you th I'm thinking about the word bubbling, Sam was thinking that the, the bubbling up would come from the sledding experience for his boy, right? But he actually, yep. the bubbling up come from this, you know? Making, making yeah. angels in the snow, yeah, absolutely. No, I just loved... I just loved that scene. I, it just, it just really just jumped out at me, Bob. That whole, that whole thing there, uh, as you explore all of these relationships. Yeah, just, just beautifully done. Now I know one. Yeah, were you going to say something? Did I cut you no, off? No, no, no. I just thank you. Yeah, because you're, you're a, a good close reader, Brand. Thank you. Oh, you're, you're more than welcome. I just, I, I, I love this story. Now, one of the things I want to do is, is uh, you all, if you've never heard Bob read from his work, um, you're in for a real treat. Now, I want to, I want to make sure that we have time for you to read uh, the passage that you want to. And then a good I, time to do it. Yeah. And then I want to yeah. think about questions. So those of you in the audience, if you've got questions uh, on Zoom, I can look at the chat, but I'd love to engage Bob that way too. But I, I wanna make sure that we kind of cordon off this time right now, Bob, for us to feel uh, your work through your voice, which is just phenomenal. Great, let me, um, let me pull that up right now. Okay, oh. now, now let me set the scene. Sam is a 16 year old who with the help of his father lied about his age to become an American volunteer in World War I. He's trained as a sniper. His father had trained him to shoot a gun effectively. He has recently arrived in the trenches in France where he's made a friend in another American volunteer by the name of Johnny Moon. The two of them and all of the other soldiers in the trench who are mostly French have just suffered a serious German attack. So here is the voice of Sam Cunningham. And I am huddled on the duck boards once more. Johnny has vanished down the trench. I rise to my feet. I follow. As I move, I stoop in deference to my German sniper counterparts, perhaps waiting a few hundred yards away for heads to appear. I navigate some bits of shrapnel ahead are thin selective sounds. 
no moaning, no wailing, just a few strands of words emerging from an afterclap of surprising silence. Sounds like quiet conversation. I pass the stirring and rising of other men who are still whole, and then things get slick underfoot and I try not to see why. Now I find Johnny on his knees, crouched beside a French soldier lying on the trench floor. Johnny slips one arm upward beneath the man's back to lift him and angles the other beneath him so he can cup the man's head in his hand. What I know, what I see but do not let myself fully see is the poilu's missing leg sheared off in a gaping smear of blood and tissue and a white bone end, the whiteness a shockingly clean seeming thing, an inviolably essential thing in its color but severed into a shard as jagged as shrapnel. Johnny brings his face close to the soldiers. The dying man is looking him intently in the eyes. Johnny holds the gaze. The man says, but softly, Maman, and again, Maman, and then, Je suis tombé. Johnny says, just as softly, Ça va, ça va. I don't follow. I am 17. I am as ignorant a boy as Lake Providence and my papa would have me be. I recognize the French language, but we are North Louisianans. What is south of us in our state is another country as foreign to me as this trench. Poilu says once more, Maman. And Johnny replies more softly still, though I hear it clearly, Je t'aime mon fils. And Johnny Moon bends to the dying soldier and kisses him on the forehead. He pulls back just a little and the poilu closes his eyes. I lift mine away. I do not understand a man kissing a man, not at all. And insofar as one might infer simply a thoughtful assessment from do not understand, it is a drastically inadequate phrase. It's the sharp snagging of my breath, the quick nauseated blooming in my chest and throat that make up this consideration. But my averted eyes see farther along the trench, another man bends to another man, another wrecked man. I retreat to the darkness of my own dying like opening my eyes in the night to stop a disturbing dream. But quickly I return to France. I have at least changed the scene. It's several hours later. I am lying in a shallow improvised trench, more trough than trench, just wide enough and deep enough to expose only head and hands and rifle at ground level. I'm part of an array of French sharpshooters in a hundred meter line flanking National Route 29. We're less than a kilometer outside Albert, waiting for the Huns' advance infantry, waiting for the further German push intended to take Albert's rail center that would cut off the French forces from the British and the way to Paris. Highway 29 is lined with poplars, a dangle with catkins, and Johnny Moon is lying barely two arm lengths away. We have just swabbed our rifle muscles and gauged the wind and familiarized ourselves with our telescopic view of the highway and the flat fields before us. Now, finally, we are settled in. Johnny Moon and I have had very little chance to speak since the shelling of the trench. He's had his French comrades to attend to and I have kept my distance. I think Whatever I witnessed, this man and I are now the only two Americans in this field, and we are perhaps about to die together. And in truth, as I lie on the verge of real war, it feels as if Johnny Moon and I are the only two men in this field, in this country, in this whole fucking world. I look over to him. He senses my glance and turns his face to me. Ready, he says. Yes, I say. It's been a tough day so far, he says, yes. Our gaze holds for a moment and I feel myself disconnecting from him. He suddenly seems stranger to me than the Huns down the road. I don't like the feeling. Was he your friend? I ask. For a flicker of a moment, Johnny doesn't understand. 
He didn't realize I was witness to the kiss, but he figures it out now. I didn't know him, he says. My 17 year old brain, trained killer though it be, is bewildered as hell. Johnny sees it. I just stare dumbly at him for the few intense moments while he works out exactly what's, what's going on and figures out how to handle it. Then he says, do you understand French? No, he nods thoughtfully, refining his decision about how to approach this. He says, a death blow like that can put a man in another place. He called me mama, which is who he was seeing. He told me he fell down, told, told his mama. I said it was going to be all right. Johnny pauses, studies my reaction so far. My face probably hasn't changed much. He knows what's disturbing me. Johnny says, then he spoke to me again as his mother. I knew he was about to die, whoever this poor bastard of a Frenchman was. So I said to him, I love you, my son. I am still a blank. Like his mama would, Johnny says, and he looks away. I think, and then you kissed him. And then I think of that other embrace going on down the trench. Johnny turns back to me. He says, look, young Lieutenant, he didn't even have to take me for his mother. And it didn't have to be me that got to him first. It could have been almost any other man in the trench who'd been spared for one more day from dying. And the dying man could know exactly who it was who'd taken him in his arms. It would all have gone the same way. But don't jump to conclusions about any one of us. This is about millions of men being forced to become somebody who has to dig a hole in the ground and then go down in it or jump out out of it and die a ferocious, savaging death when you just want to be a farmer or a teacher or a sales clerk or a guy stoking coal in a tramp steamer. And there ain't nobody else in the world but you and the rest of the fellas in the same fix. And you have good reason to believe that's how it's going to be till you're dead. Your mama doesn't even exist anymore and never will, nor your papa, nor your girlfriend, nor your children, nor anybody else. We are all we have out here, just us men. So when it's your turn to die and you need some mothering, you need some tender something like a mother would give you, then by fucking damn, we give it to each other. Most of us, most of us know that and live by that, my innocent young boy of a lieutenant. And so will you, I bet, after you get a good taste of what's coming at you from down that road. And if today is your day to die, at least maybe you'll have an American mama who could hold you when you go. And Johnny Moon turns his face away from me and looks down Highway 29. I turn my own face and I am in the dark. God says, you're back from the war already? Am I? Did you get a story down that trench? Not one for a family newspaper. And by the way, this author's tears will tell you how many times have I read that and I, I do it every time. So this, this is what literary fiction is about. Yes, it is. That was just, I don't know, I feel like uh, I need to be silent for a minute. That was, uh, wow. Folks, do you see how he, he gets down to the, like Toni Morrison talks about you know, getting down to the bone marrow, to the bone marrow. And Bob, you just did that. That was handled with such grace and, and beauty. Uh, you know, another thing I've heard you say so many times over the years is never avert your eyes. Yeah. And you, you don't. You just keep your eyes right there and deal with what your character has to deal with, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. I put this out. yeah. Well, you know, bless you for the work you bring to us, Bob. That was, uh, 
uh, uh, makes us better human beings, uh, truly. So um, I'm wondering if in the time we've got left, we've got any, any, uh, any answers. Uh, somebody says, bravo, dear Bob, from Margo here in Paris. Oh, Margo Bertaszewski. Hello, Mar Margo. Glad you're watching. Awesome. Hearing your truths that tears can hold. Merci, she says. Beautifully, just beautiful. Yes, yeah, beautifully done. Thank you. Thank you, Margo. Um, so anybody got any, any questions? Bring them on. Come on. Um, anybody in Zoom land? I'm watching the chat over here. If anybody would like to ask something of, of Bob. Come on. <laughs> oh, good, Holland. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. The great person, Holland, who introduced us, wants to know what kind of advice might you have for you know young writers uh, in in today's publishing world, uh, Bob? Oh, in terms of getting published, you mean? In or terms of published or what? Or, writing or the writing process, Bob. However, you know, whatever you can give her and us. Well, it, it, uh, be patient with yourself, as you were, Brent. Uh, if you're if you're ambition, if you if you read as much literary fiction as as you can, and I, I have twenty five suggestions for you, but um, uh, <laughs> uh, but read as much of that as you can, and 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 live live your moment to moment life in the world. I mean, I did. I went. You know, you don't have to go to war, but I went to war and I have, I've done a lot of jobs. I've worked in journalism. I did not start publishing my first novel that 40 year anniversary. I, would, I was 36 years old when I got my first novel published. And I had written five awful trial novels and a bunch of short stories. Be patient with yourself, live and understand your life to its fullest and, and um, you know, it, because it's not about willing yourself to be a writer. You must, you must be fully a human being and absorb all the, the moment to moment complex richness of life uh, to, to do that. I see, I see a question here on the, on the chat. Uh, 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 what, do you, um, what do you have left to write about? Um, and what do you wanna still explore? I'll let you all in on, on the book I'm writing right now. Two, a married couple, 72 years old, each of them. They stand on a balcony on the eighth floor of an apartment building in Paris, looking out over, of, over a park in the north of Paris, the, the Bouchemont Park. And these two people, they were married for 23 years and then divorced. And they were divorced for 10 years and 10 years ago, they remarried. And now they are falling apart again as a couple. And they have come to Paris where they originally met in that park in 1968 when they were both uh, students at the Sorbonne and all that crazy 1968 Paris stuff was going on. That's when they met. So they've come back here to see what is left of them. And what happens the day they arrive in that Airbnb Paris shuts down for COVID and they are trapped in a 500 square foot apartment with, with each other. And he is, an, he is a literary scholar about, of modernism and she is a, a, a famous novelist. And the two of them, in order to stop from killing each other, they, they decide to emulate Boccaccio. And so this, this book is a kind of modern Decameron. They tell each other stories, every, one a night, they alternate nights and, and tell each other stories as in the Decameron. Although these stories are about their fictionalized version of what their life together has been from the, from the beginning. So that's, 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 what, um, that's what I'm uh, writing about right now. Okay, if we're a focus group, what kind of feedback can we give him? Do we, does that sound cool? <laughs> that sounds awesome, Bob. So, where, where are you in the process? You've already dreamed it through. And I, I'm I'm thirty thousand words in. Yeah, I'm probably about nearly halfway through the book. Yeah. 
gosh, you are so prolific. Yeah, fantastic indeed. Somebody wanted to know, oh, did I see a hand out here? Yes, of course. I was, I'm wondering what inspired Lake City and the character and the parallel between um, yourself and the new character, yeah. looking back on your life. Um, I, I, I love it. So, Bob, um, and are you Nicole? Yes. Okay, I met your mom out there. Hey, Nicole. She said you were going to be here. Um, uh, so, Nicole wants to know, what inspired this novel, uh, Late City, and if there's any parallels between your life and Sam's? Yeah, um, that's a good question, Nicole. Of course, the parallels between my life and Sam's goes back to that compost heap. Um, it's not autobiographical, the novel, but what I know about human beings and about places, you know, journalism is there and I was a journalist. You know, war is there, I went to war. Uh, he's from Southern Louisiana or Louisiana. I, I spent 15 years in Louisiana. I mean, the, the, the elements are there. Late City, by the way, the title comes out of journalism that in the great, in the, in the great daily newspapers that used to be, you know, physical newspapers that we used to have in this country, um, they, before there, there was an internet round the clock, they would have different editions. The, to, today's newspaper would have a morning edition, a bulldog edition. Uh, the last edition of the day, which actually takes place maybe an hour or two into the next day, very early in the morning, was called the late city edition. It was the last edition to carry the previous day's dateline. And in a, in a, in a sense, that's what this is. This is Sam Cunningham's late city edition of his life. And at age 76, living in a town in, in Florida, which all through this COVID isolation, um, my town of Caps, Florida has a population of one. <laughs> and um, and in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a massive county in Florida that has a population that has 24 people per square mile. Yeah, so I, I have been I have been the epicenter of social distancing in the United States of America for for the low of these 19, 20 months, uh, 20 months now. And so um, me and existential dread, we, we, we are pals. We lie down together every night. And and so, you know, this book was a book that I still had much to finish in it uh, when all this hit. But but just at age 76, I'm, you know, it was time for me to write the old man dying book. Uh, I expect to be around a lot longer, but, um, you know, the, the, the timing was was apt to my state of being. Yeah, well, we're glad you wrote this book, Bob. We're very, very, very glad. We have uh, reached our our time. Uh, there, there, there is one question. I, I kind of my eye sneaks over to the side there in the chat, Bob. It says, "If it, does anything mm -hmm. scare you to write about it?" Is the question here? Maybe that might be a good it, one. Yeah, it's, a, it's an excellent question. It yeah. all it all does. It all scares. It all you great, the great Japanese film, you, you quoted him earlier, but the great Japanese uh, film director Kira, Kira Kurosawa once said that to be an artist means never to avert your eyes. And when you write from your deepest unconscious about the, about the great question of who the hell am I, and you do not avert your eyes, then I have to tell you, it all scares me. And if it doesn't, I'm not doing my job. Wow. I think that's a great note to end on, Bob. We cannot thank you enough for spending time with us. Uh, I know we're, our minds are probably buzzing right now with all the gems uh, that you've given us. And I just want to thank you again for being the champion that you are and also being the master storyteller that you are. Uh, I know I have learned so much from you and you've just, uh, some folks in the audience, if you're not familiar with Bob's work, I know you've affected them as well, Bob. So God bless you. Thank you for your work and thank you for your humanity, sir. We appreciate it.
right. Thank you, sir. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Bob. Have a great Saturday. All right, he's gone. <laughs> Thank you. Y'all were wonderful. Thank you. <laughs>